peace with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us, <coughs> if you allow me just to make one extra prayer, to ask for the grace of the Holy Spirit to um, help us, help me. <clears throat> Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Let us open our heart to His love, to His merciful love, Let us entrust everything to the Lord through the hands of Our Lady, all our worries, concerns, sins, errors, joys, hopes, everything. Let us put entrust everything to the Lord. And like little children, let us entrust ourselves to Him. Let us open our heart to receive His love, to receive the Holy Spirit. Give us, O Lord, graciously your Holy Spirit. Open our mind, open our heart, and pour your Spirit of light and love in us. And we ask you this, O Lord, through the intercession of Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Father Maria Jane, pray for us. So, good morning everybody. As you see, it's with a lot of um, delay. We're late to start, but hopefully um, this day will be really a, a blessed day for all of us. Maybe it's better if I stand up. Um, there is something good today that I know many of you. So this makes it easier for me. You don't hear me? Or I need to sit down then and get closer to the mic. Because I have a mic here. So, so either you see me or you hear me. You have to choose. You can't have everything in life. So, um, do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Okay. So, the mic is just in front of me, so I can't miss it. Um, no, because it goes directly to the mic, so the echo won't be heard strongly, hopefully. Um, we can't do otherwise. I mean, this is the only possibility. We will see how it goes. It should be okay because it's getting the sound from the mic, so it's okay. So, uh, today is a very special day 
for the School of Mary. Um, I don't know what would be your reaction if your grandfather was beatified. No? Imagine your grandfather, you have two, obviously. So what would be your reaction if your grandfather was beatified? Or even your father? Because we have amongst us here uh, Monique, who is a daughter of Father Marie Eugène because she belongs to his institute, secular institute, as we will mention all that. But for me, it's rather the grandfather, not the father, simply because this is how it happened to me. So I have two mixed feelings this morning. Um, an immense joy. You can't understand what it means to me, that shift in the church, to have Father Marie Eugène recognized as blessed and hopefully one day as a saint. Why? Because simply it brings holiness very close to you. I had the grace and the opportunity to live with his brothers, people who knew him. So I had, I never met him because he died in 67, 1967, and of course I only met his brothers in the mid-80s and then the rest of the years after that uh, onward. So it is, um, it is somebody whom I knew from, from day one, the day, first day I met the Carmelites, the French Carmelites in the south at Montpellier and then after in Toulouse, but the convent of Toulouse was a new one, wasn't the one, uh, a one that Father Marie Eugène knew, while the Montpellier one, he knew it. So I had the opportunity even to see places where he, he lived. So you understand the feelings on this side of things, which is um, it brings things very close to you, um, you are influenced by Father Marie Eugène if you are uh, a Carmelite or if you are one of the disciples of the C French Carmelites in the south. You receive a lot from him through them. So this is one thing. And on the other side, you, you might not believe me, but you should, I still feel extremely inadequate to talk about him because my memory fails me for the historic, some historical uh, mentioning the years or more precision for certain things. So I hope Monique will, will shout the, the year or the date. Uh, uh, so I, I need your prayer uh, because it is very difficult surprisingly, when you reach the point where you have to talk about Father Mirogen, because you get closer and closer to him and you discover how immense he is, how wide, deep and high is his person, his life. He's a saint, but not any saint. He's a great master in spiritual life, and he's a founder of an institute and as well very influential with the Carmelite nuns in, in especially in France. He was sent directly by the Pope to do uh, various things in the 50s, 60s, for, for, um, late 40s probably and, and 50s. So we have here a person who is very rich. This is why I feel very inadequate. Today I might, I will mention certain aspects. These are aspects probably that are touching me more, that are dearer to, to me, to my heart. Even aspects that are, I would say, intellectually as well important for the church. Remember that the School of Mary we teach spiritual life and he is a master in spiritual life. He wrote a book about a, a, a masterpiece, uh, which we will be talking later on. I want to see God, 
um, and I am a daughter of the church, which is in French just one book today. Initially it was two books, hence the two volumes, but today with a very, uh, you know, Bible paper, we have only one book in French from already a few years, and it is called I Want to See God. So just I Want to See God combines the two volumes. Of course, in French it would be Je veux voir Dieu. Okay? So, um, he is very important for the School of Mary. I am sure as well he is behind, very discreetly, but very uh, efficiently, uh, he is behind the foundation of the school, certainly with St. Therese of the Child Jesus. So, you understand these, um, this closeness. Uh, you, you don't expect some member of your family to be a saint, even though we knew. I remember my master amongst the Carmelites, I will be mentioning him a few times today, who, because he was first of all disciple of Father uh, Marie Eugène. Remember, Father Marie Eugène is born in 18, three years before the death of St. Therese of the Child Jesus. He's born 1894 in France, in the south of France. If you look at Toulouse, I don't know if you know where is Toulouse. Toulouse is in the south uh, west of France, the capital of the southwest. But from Toulouse, if you look a little bit northeast, you have, uh, uh, you will find his birthplace, you will find Cahors uh, and, and other, uh, Rodez, uh, other places, which is the region called Aveyron. Uh, Aveyron. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we had a cardinal from Aveyron, the arch, ex Archbishop of Paris in the 70s. Um, and um, anyway, so he, he's born uh, in, 19, in 1894 and um, entered into Carmelite order. I will come back again to his biography, but I'm mentioning the relationship between him and a person who is extremely dear to me. I consider him as being my, my master, uh, Father Louis Guillet, uh, who was his uh, novice when he was superior in the south of France, uh, Le Petit Castellet, if I am not uh, wrong the convent of the Petit Castle. It's in the south of France, very close to, uh, well, sort of closer to, to the sea. We are in the southern area of France. So in the early 20s, so he was his disciple. My master was his disciple. And then, of course, um, uh, Father Louis is born in 1902. So you see the difference in, in, in age. There, there are uh, 18 years uh, difference between them. But then, of course, you grow in, uh, in the various aspects and you grow in responsibility. And then they became a little bit, I would say, companions. Uh, not equals, of course. We will not compare two different personalities. But this explains why my personal formation was constantly uh, mentioning Father Marie Eugène, because my master, for him, Father Marie Eugène was really, really something big. Uh, so you had to position yourself in front of this uh, personality. Okay? I met, of course, brothers and fathers in the Carmelite, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the south of France, amongst the Carmelite, who knew him. So I had first hand witnesses. And uh, we will come back to that uh, later on, because it's very interesting. There is something very interesting, I will come back to it later, about uh, Father Mayor Eugène. You have extremes, I would say, of holiness, faithfulness to God. And on the other hand, you had this uh, fatherhood that you could find uh, in him, immense fatherhood, immense uh, kindness, even though he could be sometimes very sharp and clear, because, you know, 
if you have closer contact to God, you see things quicker, clearer, so obviously <laughs> you are here, it falls on you and you don't know what to do. So uh, having these first-hand uh, witnesses makes holiness very close to you with its complexity. And I think this is one of the most important aspects for us today. We are celebrating somebody who died in 67. Uh, I was privileged to, to, to know first-hand witnesses, uh, not only knowledge-wise, but life-wise. I remember their faces when they're practicing prayer of the heart. And I guess that something that come, came from Father Marie Eugène was reflected in each one of them in different ways. So, as you have on one hand his foundation, this secular institute, Notre Dame de Vie, uh, in the south of France as well. I will, be, uh, I will tell the story uh, as well here because it's, it's very important. There is another access which is mine of Father Marie Eugène. This is why you might feel that Monique will get upset with me because she will say, but you are missing the point. There are some important things you are not mentioning. Well, forgive me, uh, it, my access and knowledge to Father Marie Eugène is what, is what I'm just telling you, hmm? okay? So, um, as you have in the leaflet, and if you don't have the leaflet, I have some here. Do you have the leaflet? Um, the, the, today we will um, go through his life, um, masterpiece, teaching, and some subjects in, uh, in his uh, teaching. So, um, first of all, I'll mention a few aspects of his life to know a little bit uh, the man, the man of God. Then we will see, we will have an introduction to his masterpiece, which is uh, I Want to See God, because some of you find it a little bit difficult, some of you find it a delight. So we would like to reconcile the views, if possible, and go deeper. Um, of course, this brings us to deeper, dipping deeper in some aspects of his teaching. Uh, I can't cover everything because this will take us uh, maybe three years to cover all his teaching. So you will accept the limitations of today. And finally, I might be mentioning a little bit, of course, it, she will be there all the time, St. Therese, but as well St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila. We'll mention uh, Our Lady and, of course, the Holy Spirit, his friend. Um, the uh, Institute uh, Notre Dame de Vie, uh, founded by Father Marie Eugène, created for the occasion of the uh, beatification that happened, by the way, last Saturday. So we are still in the grace of the beatification. Um, they shaped, uh, I think, seven uh, posters. Of course, you understand, we couldn't put all of them. So I picked this one on the Holy Spirit. In the back of the church, you have two in the entrance against the uh, glass uh, door. Uh, you have two of back to back, okay? so. I invite you later on to have a look, to, to read a little bit of uh, what he says. So, without further ado, I would like to start mentioning some aspects of uh, his life. Here you will find greater limitations, because I'm not a historian, even though I have history, intellectual history in, in my mind, a spiritual history in my mind, and formation history of the church. Remember that Father Marie Eugène covers a large span in the life of the church. We cannot understand today's church if we don't understand at least last century what happened because we inherit today all what is happening today comes from a transmission or a non-transmission or a half transmission. So it is important to know a little bit the recent uh, past. So, um, I would read a little bit the introduction, the, uh, the biography here, and comment, stop 
at certain moments and comment. Okay? So, uh, Henri Grialou, this is his name, family name is Grialou. Uh, he takes the uh, name uh, Marie Eugène uh, when he becomes uh, Carmelite. And he takes, as you know, many uh, orders in the church, they have they, a name attached to them, like St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Jesus, St. Therese of the Child Jesus. So you have of the, which is a title of, of honor, a little bit like uh, uh, the, uh, when you marry, you change, if you are a woman, you change a uh, name in certain countries, not everywhere, you, ch you might change your name. So the mystery, you pick one of the mysteries uh, and um, it becomes part of your name. And the mystery that uh, he took was of the child Jesus. Like St. Therese of the Child Jesus. St. Therese of the Child Jesus. I'll be mentioning her um, soon. So, he's born in 94 at Le Gars, uh, Aveyron, southern France. He, he's, he feels the call for priesthood very early in his life. It's not common, very common, but probably in those days where society was, was more Christian, maybe the graces of God would flourish better than uh, maybe other years. But, you know, God is capable of doing whatever he wants. So he, he uh, felt the call to the priesthood, and that was very difficult to be accepted by his mother. His mother resisted his vocation. His mother, his, his dad, uh, at which age his dad, uh, dad dies? Vocation of Carmelite, yeah. But the, the, his dad dies at what, uh, which age? His dad dies at which age? Early, I think, four. Huh? 50? 15? No, he was at... His dad dies when he was 25? No. Earlier on. No, early on. Don't worry. So, his, his mother resisted uh, his vocation, uh, not to, to the priesthood, of, or, uh, not to the priesthood, but to become a, a Carmelite. Uh, and that was very tough. She really opposed his, uh, his uh, vocation. Emotionally, you can understand what happens here. He is not the only person who had that resistance. I know people who live today who had a great uh, opposition from their parents for their uh, vocation. So sometimes it's, it's what you have to deal with, no? So you have to continue to love your parents, but of course you have to choose uh, God above uh, everything else. Um, his studies for priesthood are interrupted by the war. Father Marie Eugène took part in the two, the two wars, the First World War and the Second one. Some of his brothers even dared to say that his attitude his almost, was almost a little bit military uh, when he was in the convent. Uh, he's, you know, um, in the army he was um, responsible of, of other uh, soldiers. So he would command, of course. So you guess that, you know, in the army, right is right, left is left, do this, don't do that, you have to obey. Obedience is completely blind. So something of this, some of his brothers said that was, was still there when he was dealing uh, with normal life after, between the wars and after the Second World uh, War, okay? So imagine the difficulties of the war, and we have witnesses of him uh, during the First World War who, s who describe how he behaved, how you know, all the qualities he had, uh, etc. I don't want to go too much into that because we have plenty of things to see after that, okay? 
So uh, war followed, uh, and uh, for five years, Henri Grialou took part in major campaigns at Argonne, Verdun, and Chemin des Dames, the horrible Great War. Many people died. In 1919, he was able to resume his seminary studies at Rodez, the city of Rodez. Now, before being ordained, you have a retreat, normally. And during his retreat, what happens? You know, he's destined to be a parish priest. He's at the seminary to become a parish priest. And then, before his ordination, during the retreat, he, is, he receives a very powerful grace that changes, puts everything upside down. He reads a book on uh, St. John of the Cross, the life of St. John of the Cross, who is the reformer with St. Therese of Avila of the Discalced Carmelites. Of course, we are talking reformer with Teresa of Avila. We are talking in the uh, 16th century. Mm? The Reformation, the Carmelite Reformation, happens during, uh, in the 16th century. That moment will change a lot because from that moment on, he, he wants to become a Carmelite. He doesn't have really a lot of contact with Carmelites where he is. So he will have to travel and go to the north because at that time the Carmelites were, had their novitiate in the north, in the outskirts of Paris, in that Fontainebleau, Avon. Uh, still there, the monastery, the monastery is still there. So he will start his new life. Of course, you have a lot of oppositions. Nobody accepts the idea of changing and going to become a Carmelite, etc. You understand, uh, becoming a priest is something, a parish priest, and then becoming religious is a different thing. So you, there are two different systems. You can be priest here and priest there, but your life is completely different. One is you are a parish priest, and the other one you live in a monastery or a convent, and, and you dedicate your life with others, and you live with them. And you belong to that uh, order, to its spirituality, to its life, to its style of life. So it's a completely different choice. It's a completely different choice. He spends his novitiate at uh, Avon, the convent of Avon, in the north of uh, France, very uh, outside of Paris. And we know, because he said it toward the end of his life, that the novitiate was filled with very powerful graces. Fire and flames, he says. His uh, novitiate was fire and flames, but he said it in the end of his life. So this is, we are lucky to, to be after his life now and, and have, collect all this, but maybe others didn't know that. After that, he goes to uh, Lille. He receives a donation to create something. He, he felt very early, and this is a very important point in order to understand Father Mario Eugène, he felt very early the greatness and importance of the teaching of the saints of, the, uh, of Carmel. St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and a very recent one, St. Therese of the Child Jesus. So the reading and meditation of their works has an absolute impact on him. He sees an immense richness in their teaching, and of course, as a result, he wants to spread that teaching to the world, not only to other religious people, but to the world, lay people. Hence, very few years after, he will start this institute, this secular institute, where you have lay people who consecrate their life, they take vows, but they don't live like religious people. We will come back uh, to that. Hmm? Uh, what is the intuition, how it came, etc. I'm about to start uh, that now. So while he received a big donation to start something while he was in Lille, he receives the order to, you know, obedience 
especially at that time, obedience was very military. Now a little bit less, maybe more, I don't know, more responsible, hopefully. But at that time it was like, you wake up in the morning, they tell you something, so you change, your life changes completely. You don't have any moment for preparation, you have just to di digest that and then go. Believe in God, trust in God, and go. So this is what happens. He's sent to the, from Lille, north west of France, to the south of France, the Petit Castellet in the south of France. This is where God sent him, and this is where the, uh, will be the, the birth of the, uh, his institute. Because three women will, in Marseille, who is not far from his convent, will invite him to come and give talks on spiritual life. So he will start a series of talks on spiritual life using, of course, all the doctrine of the saints. And this is the birth of his masterpiece, the I want to see God. This is from where it comes. It comes from answering the thirst of some lay people who wanted to know more about spiritual life and go deeper. So he responds to that call that God is addressing him and he offers them the teaching of the saints uh, of the Carmel. Okay? We will come back after that to, in greater detail uh, about the, uh, his book, uh, I, I Want to See God, how it will develop. At that time, of course, it will, the intuition of offering uh, a form of life to these women. They were teachers uh, at school uh, and I think university maybe uh, as well. Yes, which is yeah, univer university level, no? So uh, he, f he will find, he will have the intuition of the secular institutes before even the church had the intuition. Because the church at, th at that moment, in the 30s, didn't have yet in, the, in canon law the possibility, the idea, the intuition, the rules, the laws, to offer to people this type of life, which is you are consecrated to God, but you live a normal life. Of course, you remain uh, single. We have two branches initially, men, women, and then priests. Uh, you live, uh, you are single. You have a form, an initial formation, but then you, are, you live a normal life. You have a normal job. So you belong totally to God. You belong totally to the Carmelite spirituality, but in the same time, you have a normal life, an apparently normal life. You dress normally, etc. Okay? So the church didn't have canonically a place for this intuition, even though he had it and, and one or two others had it as well, in more or less in the same uh, time uh, in the last century. Thank God, a few years after, Pope Pius XII, if I'm not wrong, started, offered that possibility, that canonical possibility. So that was, of course, a source of great joy, and it was a confirmation to Father Marie Eugène to, uh, for him that his intuition was right, was, was coming from the Holy Spirit and not just a funny uh, solution to uh, offer a consecrated life while having an apparent uh, lay uh, style of life. Okay? Um, the foundation will develop, will start to develop, but not immediately with his presence. He gave the teaching, something started, and then immediately he is called to go to Rome to, as a Carmelite. Remember, he's a Carmelite, so he has all his duties as a Carmelite. 
He's not living outside of his monastery or his convent yet. It will be only toward the end. Uh, he won't uh, have that uh, uh, possibility. Uh, he will be traveling, of course, but he won't have that possibility. So he's, uh, uh, he is uh, called in Rome to be, uh, because in Rome you have the uh, management of the Carmelite order, it's still in Rome today. You have the superior of all the Carmelites, and then you have I don't remember, I don't know the numbers in his time, but today is around six, I think, uh, collaborators who help him to fulfill his uh, duties. And he was the second, right immediately after the superior. And the superior was Father Silverio de Santa Teresa, uh, who is a, a great Spanish Carmelite who promoted a lot the critical editions of the works of centuries of Avila really the old Carmelite type of, 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 of uh, it's a different race. Hmm? It's, uh, uh, they, are, they, are, they were uh, very, very uh, special. Some of them are still alive, but uh, the, the, old, the old generation was a little bit different. Hmm? Uh, a, li a little bit rough, but in a, in a holy way, not in a bad way. Uh, like Prophet Elijah is a little bit rough, like St. John the Baptist, a bit rough. You see which, which roughness I'm talking about? So it's the roughness of holiness. It's a little bit of the wild, wild, wild aspect. And you find that a little bit in the Carmelite order, no? It's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, it's, it's the spirit of the family. It's not bad. I'm, I'm, I, I consider it... Uh, well, this is how it is, and it's beautiful as it is. Well, I, will, I wouldn't change it. So, so he's called to uh, higher responsibilities, international responsibilities. So he has to visit different uh, uh, convents. And he is named, I don't remember now if it is immediately at that moment or a, bit, a few years after. We are in the 40s, 50s. Um, I don't know if he's named immediately uh, now, by, directly by Pope, uh, so it's probably after because can't be Pius XII uh, uh, in the 40s. So, well, second half of the 40s, yes. He's named by Pope Pius XII to, um, as an apostolic visitor of the Carmelite nuns in France. So he will have to visit all the Carmelite nuns and find a way to federate them, to have a federation or different federations to link them together so they could help each other and they could run their life according to the more, more modern needs, not to, to remain isolated. Because the way St. Teresa of Avila founded her monasteries gave uh, full authority to two persons. The, the prioress of the monastery is really, uh, has full power, full authority, if you want to manage a monastery. Of course, she is elected by her own sisters, but as well, of course, you have a superior. It could be either the local bishop or the Carmelite provincial. It depends on the regions and the history, how it developed. In France, when the Carmelites, the daughters of St. Teresa of Avila, founded new monasteries in France, remember, Teresa of Avila dies 1982, October 1982. And she, the way, she, she had already founded more than 28 monasteries in Spain. But some of her daughters felt the call to go to France and even continue further on to Italy, to Belgium, uh, actual Belgium, because remember Belgium at that time was part of Spain. Uh, Holland, Belgium, there's a little bit of chunks of, of these countries were, were Spanish, uh, Spanish territory, not Spanish, of course, in, in origin. So when they founded the monasteries in France, the daughters of Teresa of Avila, direct daughters of Teresa of Avila, um, the relationship with the Carmelite fathers was 
very distant. So it's other people who took the responsibility to manage the installation of the, this new order in France. It's rather the secular arm um, of the priests, no? The Cardinal de Berulle, Pierre de Berulle, and others had the responsibility to implement the feminine Carmelite reformation in France. And they were kept distant from the uh, fathers, the Carmelite fathers. They entered as well, but they were uh, separate. I won't enter in greater detail, that's enough to know. So when Pius XII sends Father Marie Eugène as his representant, apostolic uh, visitor, to the different Carmelite, to all the Carmelite monasteries, you need to understand what is happening here. Some of them, but it's a known say, no? This is the first time we see a Carmelite from centuries. And it was Father Marie Eugène. But a man of God, a deep man of prayer, uh, really, really a deep experience of God, God gave him as well the capacity to convince and to gather the Carmelites with prudence and uh, gentleness. He was able to federate them under the orders of Pius XII, of course. He was obeying to the direction he was. So it's just to tell you, to show you the variety of responsibilities he had. Since he was in Rome, he had the opportunity to travel a lot. He went to the Philippines. One of the early foundations of the Notre Dame de Vie is in the Philippines. I was meant to show you a PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation with all different pictures of him from day one till uh, his death and after, made by the Philippine uh, um, uh, branch of Notre Dame de Vie. But uh, we couldn't find a, a screen. But I still have, we still have, I mean, Monix gave me, very kindly gave me that PowerPoint. Um, if you want to see it, it's silent. It's supposed to be commented. You have the text, but it's silent. I transformed it into a video, but till now we don't have the permission to publish it, to show it. But if you want, in a private way, I, I ask me and I will send you the video. Uh, it's a PowerPoint, but transformed into a video, so you can watch it on, online. Uh, it's a very pleasant because you, you, you get pictures, you get a sense of what is happening. But of course, commented would be, would be certainly be better. Now, back to, um, so he travels a lot, and this traveling helps him as well uh, sow the seeds of his institute in other places. So you see how the providence of God works. He used his responsibilities as a Carmelite, as an opportunity to go and uh, sow the seeds of the Carmelite life for lay people. You see what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say, okay? So, um, he, after the, um, after, um, I think, one or two years, uh, the superior general of the Carmelites in Rome dies in, uh, in Mexico. Father Silverio, the, this great Carmelite, Spanish Carmelite, dies in uh, Mexico. So who then becomes the superior general? Him, Father Mario Gen. So Father Mario Gen became the superior general for, uh, I don't remember now, uh, not too much, but uh, some time. He is behind the foundation of the uh, Collegio Internazionale in Rome, which is the seed for the actual Theresianum, the university of uh, the Carmelites in Rome, where I personally did my studies. So, as you see, it brings things home. Huh? So he's behind the foundation of that university, which is an amazing initiative, because this university uh, is uh, offering to whoever wants to go there in, while in Rome uh, uh, teaching uh, specialization uh, in spiritual uh, theology. They have a master degree 
today they have a master's degree in spiritual theology and even they can offer a PhD in spiritual theology on top of normal theology and supernatural uh, anthropology, which is another branch of specialization they have. So um, he is behind that foundation and he saw it and he inaugurated that uh, place. Now, let us continue the journey. Um, after a while, uh, he is not uh, elected. You know, you have elections every six years uh, in the Carmelites. He's not uh, elected a superior general or even uh, definitore, which is the, who are the, uh, the ones who um, they are the collaborators of the superior general. So he goes back to France. And this is an opportunity for him, of course, to go back to normal Carmelite life. He had a normal Carmelite life in Rome, and we have the, uh, the, the Carmelite fathers in Rome who witness his faithfulness to the prayer of the heart. This is a very, very, very important point here I'm, I'm underlining. Father Maria Jeanne was absolutely adamant on the practice, the necessity, every day. So this gives you an idea of the man. Every day, two complete hours of prayer of the heart or mental prayer as we used to call it before hmm? silent prayer contemplative prayer B why because Teresa of Avila's uh, requirement for the Carmelite nuns was that one and he kept it it was as well of course in the Carmelite rule uh, laws constitutions if you prefer constitutions to be more precise the Carmelite fathers and of course he was very faithful but you need to know that when you have a lot of responsibilities, if you are in Rome, you have a lot of responsibilities, it's very tiring uh, in the management uh, the, or the convent that manages the entire order. So of course, sometimes if you are tired or if you have other obligations, you might miss uh, the prayer of the heart. Father Mario Jean never, never, never missed the prayer of the heart. And I can witness to that tradition because I saw it with his brothers and uh, sons and brothers, if you prefer, in France, many years after. He dies in 1967, and when I can, what I can witness is in the mid-80s till now, I never saw the brothers miss one of these two hours in their entire life. And if one of the brothers is not present in the chapel, the others would worry and go and find him in his cell, because you call it cell, no? Uh, because he might be ill. That's the only reason why he wouldn't go down. So you have to rush and go and see what is happening and maybe bring him some food. So that's, that's him. That's not just the Carmelites. If you travel in other places, in other um, uh, countries, the Carmelites in other countries, they don't have that adamant faithfulness to the prayer of the heart. This comes directly from Father Mario Eugène. Since I'm talking about that, let me finish that topic. You need to know, probably you don't know it, some of you know it, um, that it, toward the end of the 60s and the 70s, the church went through a very, very, very difficult time. Many priests and many religious left. It was the time. It's, some people think that this is because of Council Vatican II. No. It's because of the times, the mentality, the culture that was changing. It's the Beatles time, it's, um, uh, how is the, 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 the thing in, uh, in California, the uh, rock thing, what's it called? Say again? Yeah, Bob Dylan, what is the other one? The, the, big, the big gathering uh, in the California, where you would, would smoke uh, marijuana, hippies. Yeah, it's the hippies time, it's the deep change in society, and obviously this influences the church, whoever in the, is in the church. So if you study the culture, you will understand the influence because there are plenty of places in the world that didn't have that wave of change immediately. They had it a few years after. They weren't hit. Priesthood, religious remained as it was. So we shouldn't blame Council Vatican II 
for that crisis. We should just try to understand the reality. This is post-war, post-Second World War. This is, these are the changes in society. And the church is in the society. So, of course, Father Mario Eugène didn't witness enough of that earthquake that happened because he died in 1967. A few things happened, yes, toward the end, but not, not enough. But you need to know that, for instance, let us take a practical example. The Carmelites I meet in the south of France, for instance, no? at Montpellier in 1985 or 86 to be precise, 86. There are very few, there are not many, because many left. In the 60s, many left, and it's a big wound. Of course, we're not here to, to judge, I'm just telling history, eh? just for you to understand. The ones who remained, how did they remain? Great poverty and limitations in means, but great faithfulness to the prayer of the heart on a daily basis. I will always remember Father Joseph Baudry, who was prior when I discovered the Carmelites in the south of France. Uh, he was prior of the convent of Montpellier. But, you know, I, know he, I knew him for many years. He was the uh, director of my uh, small thesis for the master's degree. <coughs> he always, uh, 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 I always remember that, uh, him mentioning that during these difficult times, in the end of the 60s and 70s, I was alone during the prayer of the heart, the two hours in the morning and the afternoon alone doing it. These are the ones who continued. These are the bridge between before the crisis and after the crisis. And I want to underline here the immense debt they have, and of course I have, toward Father Mario Eugène, because they s stuck to his indications. And this is very important. Of course, I'm telling the story of Father Marajan from the Carmelite side. Uh, other people will tell it from different angles. Fair enough, I'm, 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 nobody is complete. Huh? So this is, this is very important. So you see, the man is not just influencing in his teaching or anything. This is his life. The way he influenced his brothers was to practice. Until today, they wouldn't change it even though other areas in the world might sort of took a little bit off these two hours, they wouldn't change it, okay? So it's important to know that his teaching and his life, his practice of the prayer of the heart on a daily basis is central. You cannot understand the man, the man of God, if you don't understand that he is meeting God every day, 60 minutes in the morning and 60 minutes in the late afternoon. So there are some pictures of him that are very beautiful. I think we have it, uh, in, you have it here. You see that some people say that his face is carved by God. Look at this, this picture. Of course, the photographer is, is brilliant, but that's not enough. This is one of the pictures we have. His face is carved by God. We, you can read some witnesses, people, uh, who were praying with him. So obviously when you pray, you look at. I did look when I was praying with the Carmelites. I looked at their faces because when you are a beginner, you, you wonder, what is happening there? Are they meeting God? Uh, do, are they seeing something? What is happening there? So of course you're curious. And my master, Father Louis, he tell, tells the story when he was a beginner. But back in the 20s, 1920s, and he says that he looked at Father Mario Jean and was very impressed. Very simple attitude, but very deep. And they say he was away. He was present in his body, but you knew that his heart and his soul was away, it was with God. So you need to understand that everything 
everything that you can find, everything good that you can find in Father Marie Eugène, the blessed Father Marie Eugène, comes from that meeting point, daily meeting point between him and his God. When he speaks, and um, allow me here to, to mention something, he said that initially, because we find that it's a letter he sent to a priest explaining how he preaches. And I think this letter is worth a, a million dollar, <coughs> or sterling, if you want. Um, <coughs> he says to this priest, he is trying to help him for his homilies. This priest is relatively young. He's not totally young, but relatively young. So he gives him the advice. He says, look, in the beginning, I used to write down my, uh, my homilies and my teaching. Remember, he started to teach to these uh, uh, young uh, ladies uh, who wanted to know the Carmelites, etc. He has the preaching, of course. You have plenty of preaching to do as, as a Carmelite, a local in your, in your convent, and as well when they ask you to go. If the Carmelite nuns ask you to go somewhere, you have to preach, so you have to prepare. He said that one day, one of the, uh, they didn't wear it only uh, female lay people, they had as well some philosophers. So he was a little bit impressed and he thought he had to do something proper. And uh, he said that after a few, few uh, lectures or, or talks he gave, uh, one of the uh, philosophers came closer to him and said to him, when you leave your notes, this is where we find you, when we find you. When you are reading your notes, it's a little bit like, it's beautiful style, of course, he tried, he, he liked style initially, he says, not me, he says that he liked style, French style, to, 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 you know, to perform, to speak properly. But then he was very surprised that when this philosopher, he's a philosopher, so, you, res you would respect his observation, I think, to a certain extent, uh, when he says, when you leave your notes, you are better. So he said that he then made an effort, and it is true, we have, I have witnesses, I mean the fathers, said to, said to me, he, he hardly read in his life. But we didn't know where, from where he came. He came from having written first, reading, then abandoning that system into reading. And people used to say when he speaks, he speaks from what is inside, what is inside. And certainly this is better. So of course, he says, I would have many French grammatical imperfections in what I'm saying, many errors, French speaking errors, but French language, but, but the great advantage is that it will be direct line and not through the means of the reading. It's an effort, so he was inviting this priest to try that and change the system. Um, many priests, uh, many of his um, companions and disciples and companions, the Carmelites, they said he had just few notes, few, few lines, and f with these lines he would then take off. Take off? Take off. So uh, that's, that's uh, interesting here. So you see how him meeting God being central and him, when he talks about God, he is more, he remains connected to God. You see what I'm trying to say? And I would like to add, don't ever think that he is diving in the richness of something. He himself will say, I am extremely poor not poor financially, uh, he's a religious, so he's poor, of course, but he is very poor in the sense of having something to say or, or to transmit. So you understand that God gives him on the spot. Let us not exaggerate, there is a training, a preparation. He's a very intellectual person. I, I'll be talking about that when we will start the uh, presentation of the uh, I want to see God. So, now, to, to, to sort of uh, um, uh, close that first uh, talk on his life, um, he has the, so he comes back 
he lives a Carmelite life. Then a few years after, he shares the responsibilities with other brothers to be a provincial. And as well, he will have the permission to stay at Notre Dame de Vie, because you remember he's a Carmelite. He's supposed to stay in his monastery. He's not supposed to stay anywhere else as a Carmelite. So he has the permission to stay at Notre Dame de Vie. He gives retreats, teachings, etc. And of course, uh, the day comes where the Lord is calling him. He becomes ill. He goes through, uh, of course, the classic difficult moments that the saints have toward the end. And of course, he dies in uh, March uh, 1967. Okay, so shall we stop here? Because I think, um, I don't know how, how long it, it took us, but shall we stop here just now? Some uh, logistics, um, as, as, as you see, uh, today we are here, not in the back room, uh, sadly, but sadly, happily, uh, because we have the Lord, we have the Lord and we are in the house of the Lord, not the house of the Lords, but the house of the Lord. Um, so that's, that's, we are very grateful to be, uh, to be here. But for uh, having tea and coffee, um, I trust that if you go to the same back room where usually you have the courses, you can have coffee uh, and tea for a, a very small uh, donation. So please don't hesitate right now to go. Uh, but you go and gently come back. Huh? <laughs> don't stay there for two hours. <laughs> Thank you. How long, How long? Well, as I said, you go and gently come back. So <laughs> five, six, seven, eight minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes maximum. Maximum. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, the